All right, everybody, welcome back to the More Doors podcast. Today is episode 30. That is 30, for those who are speaking Spanish today. <laughs> we have an amazing guest on the show, and we can't uh, wait to get into his story. We'll be back with the details on that right after this. Okay, everybody, welcome back. Again, episode 30 of the More Doors podcast. I am joined with my two fabulous co-hosts, Brian Force and the one and only Nick Good. What's up, boys? What's up? Happy 30th, buddy. Happy 30th. Yeah. Look at us. I wish it was my 30th again. <laughs> I think we all wish to be a little younger, but with the same knowledge we have today, that way we could just have that energy of just... Yeah. Yeah. Being able to run through, like, look, if you're like, I can run through that wall knowing that the, the gold is on the other side. Like, just think about that. Like, we've got, we've got Aaron Katz here, and I'm sure that with the knowledge he has, I mean, what kind of damage could you do if you were 24, 24 25, okay. with that, all that testosterone <laughs> flowing through? I'm trying to hang on, trying See, to hang on. I love it. That's way more inspiring than where I was going to go with that. I was going to do... Do you ever think about time in like historical moments? For example, I realized recently that you remember when Jordan went to play baseball for that year? Yes. That's closer to the moon landing than it is to today. Really? Yeah. That's and crazy. That makes you feel so old. Agreed. Like me, you know, isn't that weird? I, I hear you. I, yeah, I don't I, like I, to think about that. Vanessa right? was saying <laughs> something the other day about 24 years ago in 2000 was 1976. And I was like, yeah. Whoa. Like, that's the stuff I think about. That's crazy. Mm. That's yeah. crazy. It's like yeah. it's back to the future. Yeah. All right. So before we get started <laughs> with our guests, shifting gears here quickly before we go down the rabbit hole, uh, I want to say thank you to our two sponsors. Number one, Deep Blue Capital. We continue to make it happen. Go check us out at deepbluere.com. Uh, we have an LOI that's on the cusp of being accepted. We have a couple others out there that are gaining steam and have an appetite for more. So go subscribe to the newsletter brought to you by the one and only Brian. I knit my own shirts force. <laughs> and uh, we got some great things coming. Let's also give a nod to Tor Studios. Mm -hmm. Go check out Jesse at T-O-R-E Studios.com. Jesse does a fantastic job. Go check out our YouTube channel. By the way, Deep Blue Capital YouTube channel. So Shameless plug. Yeah. All that's Jesse's work at Tor Studios. He does a great job. Appreciate you, Jesse. There's a number of other podcasts that uh, are doing extremely well in the marketplace. So go check him out. Tell him we sent you. Tell him he's got a great beard, and he might just save you a few clams. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's an, that's an up like, north reference. You like that? Yeah. You don't hear that a lot around well, here. We have no clams in Texas. It, well, there are there not? Nothing, none that Is you there would probably water? You're talking to a guy that would know. Well, I don't think yeah. he would know. Well, I don't you know. don't He's, fish clams. Yeah. Uh, you die like, for them, right? You, no, you like rake them off the bottom of the yeah. ocean. That's yeah. not considered fishing. Though. What do those it's, people call it, though? Catching? They call it clamming. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if that's true, because at our lake, when the water recedes, that's there's what, those, clam shells. Those are mussels. Uh, those, those are, are big, are, though. They're bad, they're bad mussels, and they're bad for your boat. Yeah. Have you eaten mm. them out of the lake? You can't no. eat them. No. Lake, but don't do that. No. Uh, some of the lake people. Some of the lake people do. The lake people, like the natives. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The lake people that have been there forever, absolutely. So, so, um, <laughs> so let's stop right there yeah. before that goes any yeah. deeper. All right. Look, um, we've got a, an amazing guest. I've known this guy a long time, right? Um, we crossed paths. Uh, he didn't know it, but we crossed paths back in the Lifestyles Unlimited day. So I did. That's you know, we 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 had lunch the other day. We have Aaron Katz on, by the way. Hey, everybody. Um, and I was like, man, Aaron, we've met before. And he's like, uh, don't really remember. It was a long, long time ago. It's all coming back to me now. Right? You, weren't, yes. you weren't quite as bulky then. I was not. I didn't have the beard. Right? So like, like I'm not allowed to shave this beard anymore because it's kind of like the, the staple. And plus, my wife would leave me because she doesn't like what's underneath. Um, that's a whole different show. His personality is <laughs> underneath. Yeah. The, the wives are coming on the show to, to, to talk all about being what it's like being married to people like us. But uh, we met at Lifestyles at a pig, P-I-G, meetup. What is that? That is yeah. the preferred I didn't that the other day. Yeah, yeah, preferred investment group, I think is what it was called. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the Lifestyles. I wasn't sure where you guys days. were going with that. Yeah, and uh, this was, this was um, 
if, if I can tell the story really quick of, of one, how long ago this was. This was back, I think, in 11 or 12. Yeah, I joined um, in 11. So I think it was right around then, then. Um, and Lifestyles Unlimited, you know, is a great investment group, you know, really big at the time. I don't know what it's like today, but um, we, we put out a lot of clams, you know, Matt, the Matt reference there to join this group. I think it was like ten thousand dollars back then. Back then, nice. And we were interested because we, you know, my brother and I were were buying some single family and some flips, and you know, we we went to the lifestyles meetup, um, one of their one of their seminars, and they they talked about you know you can you can uh, you can't really become really really wealthy and to retire or have time freedom just buying single family properties, and if you do, it's going to take forever. They're like, so you should get into investing in apartments. And, you know, we, we joined their their preferred program, which is called PIG, Preferred Investment Group. And that's where they had all the, the meetups happening there. And um, that's where we crossed paths. Now, yeah. I, now I remember way back then. That was the start of my multifamily journey. Okay. Well, perfect. So this so, is where we dive in. Yeah, this is this is, this is <laughs> on that note. Segue. Yeah, yes. this is a great segue on that. So Aaron Katz of, of Aaron Katz Apartment Investing, right? The Correct. Legend. Yeah, that's um, my brand. Legend, Aaron. Katz. And tell tell people a little bit about your background because you you definitely have a, a very you know very great you know story. And then how did you get into to multifamily investing? Well, really, I, I, I'll go ahead and tell you how I got started in multifamily investing, and, and then I'll kind of get back, um, go backwards. Um, the child of immigrants on both sides of my family, so I'm a first-generation American. Um, on my dad's side, Russian, Polish, Jews. Um, came from family that had a lot of other family members perish in the Holocaust, um, and wanted to come to the United States, saw it as the land of opportunity to come here and achieve uh, the American dream. And as I move on in the story, I, th I think that my family and, and now me and my children as a result are, are achieving that and have been able to achieve that. My mother's from England. So I said, as I said, I'm first generation American on both sides of the family. And so I grew up, I, my dad saw that he saw he was a hard worker, worked six to seven days a week the first few years of my life. So I didn't see him a lot. I was with my mom and my dad was always working. Um, sales, hardcore sales floors, that was kind of what my dad was doing. And he saw that to achieve what he really wanted to achieve, he needed to be the owner of a business. He didn't need to be just an employee. And um, decided that he wanted to start business and, and hopefully achieve that entrepreneurial American dream. And he launched a few businesses when I was young. Uh, carpet business was one of the first ones he tried to break into. And then later it was uh, the mattress business, the bedding business. There might have been a business or two along the way. I was pretty young. They were always fun businesses, though, for a young kid because my parents ended up divorcing when I was five. And then when I would spend every other weekend with my dad, he'd be working. So I would be hanging out in the backs of these stores. And, but the cool thing was they were either carpet or mattress stores, which is pretty cool for like a five to seven year old kid to you know, jump around yeah. on, right? So um, a lot of people out there bought mattresses and, and you know, put carpet down in their home that I had jumped and rolled all <laughs> over. But um, so, and I think my dad tells stories that very early on, I was trying to sell to the customers that would you know, come into the store. So. Um, salesmanship, uh, entrepreneurialism, all of those things were kind of built into my core. And then my dad did achieve a measure of success with a company called Mattress Discounters on the East Coast that he was able to grow, uh, eventually sold to semi-retire in his 30s, and then was brought back in, and then eventually sold again. So I grew up in and around the mattress business. And my father, being an immigrant that grew up pretty poor, I mean, when my father's side of the family came to the United States when my dad was 14 in 1960. They didn't speak any English. They didn't have any money. So it was really just starting fresh here in the United States. So coming from that background, and even as we didn't have much when I was young, but then he started to achieve some measure of success and our standards of living got better. It was important to him that I think that I grew up with a, a strong work ethic. Um, and so he very quickly put me to work uh, in my teens, and I really did everything that could do in and around the mattress business, from working in the warehouse to tying mattresses on customers' uh, cars after they bought, bought beds, to doing accounting in the back office. 
and uh, all, all the different menial jobs that you could do. You know, even the janitorial stuff I did. Um, but it was good, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do it. And then when I was about 19, I had the opportunity to get on a sales floor. And these were hardcore, straight commission sales floors. It wasn't like a cushy base, and then you earned you know, a small percentage of commission on top. These were straight commission. So if you didn't sell, you didn't make. But I ended up, I think, even maybe a little bit to my dad's surprise, uh, thriving out of the gate. Salesmanship was something that I just took naturally too. Um, and then uh, in my early 20s, after doing that for several years, uh, had the opportunity to partner up with a few people and come down to Texas and uh, launch a company called Mattress Giant. And some people might be familiar with Mattress Giant, so I was an original partner in that company along with my father and two other gentlemen. And then later we brought in my uncle as well because he brought a skill set into the business that would benefit it. And then another gentleman as well. And we ended up growing that company uh, for about six years until we had the opportunity in the late 90s to uh, sell. And uh, next 10 years, I kind of tried to find my path. I, I, we had sold the business and had done pretty well, but what was I gonna do next? Um, Did you feel a little lost? I mean, after, because that was your, I don't know if, if you're like us or, or me, where that kind of became your identity. Yeah, and I, and, and I was the youngest of the six partners by far. So I think everybody else saw it as an opportunity to, to cash out and just move on. And for me, I'm not going to complain about being in my late 20s and being able to put multi-million dollar payday into yeah. my pocket. Yeah. It was, um, but what am I going to do now? Where is my purpose going to be? And, and, and w what's the direction? So in answer to the question, was I lost? Yeah. And I think um, over the next 10 years, I, I did different things. Some were successful, some were not. But it was always about trying to find w what's going to be my path. Um, I, I, I achieved success in the business, but I kind of came into it through my dad. What's going to be my path and that's what i was looking for in my late 30s um when i when i got started in apartment investing which obviously over the last 12 years has proven to be my path yeah so just curious right i mean that's a there's so much there that we can dig into right i mean i love the kind of immigrant work ethic i heard that a, a long time ago i think on a dave ramsey podcast or something there was a book about it and I, i've seen that so much but of all the things you could have done Right after a successful exit and trying to kind of find your next path, what was it about multifamily that resonated with you or super interesting to kind of serve as your calling for the next phase of your life? I saw it as a means to come in, wealth creation, wealth building, and I, I saw it as a business, though. Mm -hmm. It's the apartment investing business, right? It's not just about... Uh, and, and I've always tried to bridge that gap. You know, I love to be on podcasts and I love to speak because I want to help more people. But for me, it was not about just being a pure syndicator, right? It was about taking the skills that I had from being a business owner in the past and bringing those into the apartment investing business and then just learning the industry specific knowledge that I needed, which I gained from mentorship as we spoke about and now just 12 years of experience and I continue to learn each and every day because I'm, you can never stop learning. But I saw it as a business to come into that would allow me to build and create wealth and help other people to do the same, which is what I do for my passive investors. But also while I was building wealth, ha enjoy a lifestyle, right? The first group we joined was called Lifestyles Unlimited. And it was that the real estate investing business was one where you could work with and leverage vendors and systems and, and teams to build and create wealth while you could also enjoy a life at the same time, not just 30 years down the road after you had built and created the wealth. And then that day really never comes and people look back and have never taken the time to enjoy life. So I've always, Matt, tried to strike a balance, I think, between helping others, building and creating wealth, but making sure that I take time now to enjoy life. And if anybody follows me on Social media, I, I think that I've achieved a pretty good balance of that over the last 12 years. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely, uh, I'm definitely envious of, of some of the adventures that you've taken. You, you said something before that, that I want to dig into, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, we've kind of talked about this on a couple other episodes, but the concept of transferable skills across businesses, right? So what were, you mentioned 
multifamily as, as a business, the apartment investing business, I completely agree. We were just talking about this over lunch the other day. But if you had to say that the top two or three transferable skills from the mattress business that you sold into multifamily investing, what do you think those three skills were for you and how it kind of got you started? I think when I started to learn about the business and I saw what was required, I realized that there's, you're kind of the center at the spoke of the wheel when you're putting together a real, real estate transaction. And there's all these different spokes around the wheel. And you're kind of just directing the process. And I never proclaimed in any of the ends of those spokes of the wheel to be the smartest guy in the room on any of those. But I don't bring ego to it. If I don't know something, I'll go ask from somebody that knows more than me in that specific area. But what I think I've been really good at is to have that bigger picture in mind and to be able to kind of direct the process. And when you're putting together a real estate deal, to me, that's really what it's all about. There's so many different things going on, and there's somebody that has to be able to see the bigger picture and pull all of the pieces together. Another thing I think that, that I've a, a skill set that I brought in was just the ability to sit down and talk with people mm. and build relationships and to build long-term relationships. Because when I came into this business, I saw it as a long-term business. I heard stories of guys that were 70, 80 years old that had slowly over the years built up a portfolio of 10 to 15,000 units. And it wasn't about necessarily you know doing it in a period of three years they just slowly and steadily built over the years and then they were able to look back and they built this empire mm -hmm. and and I, I saw that as being something that I wanted to do so um, obviously salesmanship negotiating skills um, management of people mm. because you're working with systems and teams of people uh, third-party management companies um, lenders, et cetera, and kind of being able to talk to all these people, but kind of direct that process. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, it definitely did. I, I, I love well, probably, that. Probably relationship, right? In the mattress, you know, I, I would assume that in that industry that, you know, number one, how many, how often do people come back and buy a mattress? Like right. it's probably every 10 years, maybe. I don't know what the average turn is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, from that relation standpoint, you're probably working the referrals to really be able to to get enough people in the door to really build something up. So, I mean, we've seen just when we had lunch the other day that you're you're very much a relational person, um, and that is a skill set that not a lot of people have at a high level. Yeah, well, at, least thanks, the, guys. at least genuinely. Yeah, right? genuinely. I think genuine. some yeah, yeah. Let's I think say some genuine. people yes. like project it. Yeah early on when they need something right mm -hmm. but i mean it's the i think long-term relationship development is like a truly unique skill and not everybody can do it because there's, right. there's uh, some kind of hidden agenda well, oh well now i feel so much better if i knew i was going to come in here and you guys were just, just going to say nice things we're gonna, about me we're going to shower you i wouldn't have been nervous at all yeah. shower you exactly. yes well yeah. you so obviously the relationship aspect has been huge for you you've also i mean you've done double digit deals now as a sponsor you you have a very impressive track record and that relationship building uh skill that you have also has to be parlay with some parlay with some sort of approach right you're raising capital for your first few deals you have to have a system around doing that it has to be organized in some way it can't just be from the the you know by the seat of your pants how did you approach raising your first set of capital for your first few deals and how do you approach it today what is what is a methodical approach that you say you take or kind of a mindset around it well i'll go back I'll, I'll share a story from the first deal so i decided quickly on and when i remember when some people would come into uh the, the, you know i'll just go back to the beginning 2011 at lifestyles a lot of people would come in and feel like oh i gotta invest passively in a few deals before i'm ready to be a what they called a lead investor mm -hmm. right we call it deal sponsor mm -hmm. syndicator yeah. etc right. interchangeable mm -hmm. terms and I, I didn't see, and I still don't necessarily see that you're going to learn the skill set needed to be a deal sponsor by being a passive investor because they're two completely different animals. Agreed. But even back at that time, I think I saw that. So I said, no, I'm going to come in very quickly. I defined my criteria, and I said, I'm going to do a deal, ideally around 80 to 100 units that's going to support third-party property management. 
and that's going to be and and there was some other criteria defined there as well so before i even had a deal lined up though i said i'm just going to sit here for about five months and i'm going to continue to invest in my education here i went to all of the events took a lot of handwritten notes and just met a lot of people one-on-one just like we've had the opportunity to meet each other uh, although we met a long time ago but re-meet each other and to meet brian and matt for the first time here recently and i outlined to people in hundreds of meetings probably in a span of six months here in dfw meeting at every starbucks i know where every starbucks is across (laughs) the metroplex uh exactly what my goal and vision was going to be and then i said when i land a deal that fits this criteria can I call back on you for a potential investment at that time? And just about everybody said yes. So then I did end up contracting on a deal that met the criteria. So then I was able, I'd already, I'd already been building my database before I even had the deal. Um, obviously over the years, that database has grown quite a bit. Yeah. And so it's, it's just about uh, you know, reaching people and then communicating with them, obviously answering their questions. People wanna know. Um, especially now in 2024, there's a lot of great opportunity that's right here, right now, uh, on the buy side. Yeah. Unfortunately, some passive investors right now are a little bit gun shy. Their money might be tied up on deals that aren't cash flowing, or they just don't have the liquidity because it's all tied up, or they've just heard some horror stories of deals that have struggled over the last couple of years, mm-hmm. and uh, they're kind of sitting on their hands. And it's a process of really re-educating them and saying that the way that we can buy deals right now in 2024 is taking advantage of some terrific opportunity that's here now and coming for various reasons. And you have to help them explain that we're not buying deals like people were in 21, 22 uh, that led to some of those deals struggling. You have to Mm -hmm. re-educate, right? And I, I love that you said that because all you've outlined is that you were just consistent with your activities like 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 any other successful person and i'm glad that you highlighted that because i think the easy thing is to you know for for a, a potential aspiring investor with limiting beliefs to go well it was easy for aaron he was 28 and sold you know a company and you know he probably already had that massive network and a huge margin of error but you went to meetups you met people at starbucks you did the thing that every yeah. successful investor will tell you to do do the consistent activity well let so. me fill in a little bit more of that story because nick said and and i appreciate you bringing it up he said were you a little bit lost there in those 10 years and for some of those 10 years i was because i was searching and meanwhile brian to fill in some of those gaps you know i'd i'd gotten divorced from my first wife um, and I had I'd run through quite a bit of that mattress giant money. Yeah. So and I, the business uh, venture that I had launched right before I got into apartment in- investing, it was a children's furniture business, and it was not a successful business. It was probably my least success- successful venture of my life, mm-hmm. and it was a business that I threw a lot of money at to try to get to turn the corner. So I was not in the financial position at 38, 39 that I'd been at yeah. when I was 28 years old. Now, with that being said, I still was in a better position than a lot of people and had the ability to get started. But I probably had a net worth of about 400000 when I got started in the business back yeah. in 2011. That's a very, I appreciate you sharing that because it's a very human way to, to, to tell that story and get past some of that. We're always looking for the excuses of why not us. Right. You know, that guy had the leg up. He had the advantage. And I, and I really appreciate you, you sharing that. Would you talk about... You had the mindset right away that getting into multifamily, you were attracted to it because you were buying a business, right? And I had a, a, a big aha moment when, when we did our first deal where I was a sponsor, where when we would encounter obstacles, it was really freeing to go, there's so many levers we can pull because this is a business. It, it, you have the latitude to be creative and, and think um, you know, really deeply and, and run the business in a really efficient way. And there's lots of different things you can do. Whereas where a lot of people get started in investing is stuff like single family flips, where if it doesn't go according to plan, you have very few strings to pull. Like you're losing money if it doesn't go according to plan. But people still start there, which is interesting because the margin for error is actually really razor thin. Did you ever have an aha experience kind of like that when you got into the business where you went, this is proving to be my thesis around I'm actually buying businesses, not real estate. And here's that aha moment as to how that's manifesting itself. 
I don't know if there was necessarily an aha moment. I think I pretty much understood that out of the gate. Yeah. And I looked at it as a business. I looked at it as just another business in real estate and buying real estate happened to be yeah. part of the business. But to me, it was always the apartment investing business, right? It's revenue minus expenses mm -hmm. equals profit, yeah. just like the mattress business, except it was real estate as, as the vehicle. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, I don't really have an aha no, moment like for I, you. I, I, but like I'm thinking back just and I'm trying to think of actionable sort of, you know, ways to to give a tip. There's like if it's if it's as easy to underwrite as something like knowing whether or not to buy a flip, that feels like the barrier to entry is really low. But that also means the margin for error is really low mm -hmm. and the risk is really high. Underwriting multifamily deals can be very complicated, and that's why it seems very scary for most investors aspiring but this is a lot right but that's also where you get the ability to bring a lot of value when you do it right because you're running a business you're not just you're not just renovating a home and if you mess it up you mess it up and sorry everybody loses their money you know yeah. and I, I that's what i've loved about this business i love that you had that mindset from the beginning yeah yeah would you say aaron that again let's go back to the educational piece of this right and and today you know apartment syndication or syndicators or capital raisers, they're, it's more of a sexy buzzword than it was back in 2011, right? That wasn't something that on any social media we really saw much of, or whatever the social media was out there at the time. I'm trying to remember what it was back in 2011, a little bit of Facebook. I was on Facebook yeah. in yeah. 2011. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and, but would you say like, like that the group lifestyles would would Dell at that time kind of teaching it more like this is a business related type of operation rather than just the real estate would you say like the educational piece the right educational piece at that time helped kind of set that tone or did you just because you had that entrepreneurial background you was like oh yeah. this is a business all the way yeah you know I have some thoughts around kind of where I see the business and syndication where it's gone from when I came into the business to where I see it a lot today. So I'll just approach it from kind of that side. Yeah. I, I do think that when I came back in, people weren't all over social media talking about apartment investing and, and syndication. And I, I remember I would start to just post about what was going on and talk about what I was actually doing. And at that time, I was one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. And I remember people saying, Aaron, we really love your Facebook post because you're sharing in a general sense of what you're doing and it's educational and we're able to kind of keep track of you. But it stood out because just a lot of people weren't doing it. And I didn't really think of it as anything else other than just being transparent because you know, I believe people do business with people they know, like, and trust. And the first word in there is no, right? So people got to feel that they know you from a business perspective, but also, you know, your family, your friends, your hobbies, your interests, who you are, and then you click and resonate with the people that you're meant to, and maybe you don't resonate with the people that you're meant not to be, to resonate with, and, and that's fine too. So I was just doing it naturally, and people would say, wow, Aaron, we really love your posts. Well, in 2024, I mean, I've been left behind, because I'm just kind of still doing it, but it's, it's just authentic, and, and now I think the apartment syndication business it's become, and this is not across the board, and there are exceptions, but it's become more about style and less about substance mm -hmm. and Flashy. more about flash yeah. yep. and um, not about truly understanding the apartment investing business. When I came into the industry from 2012 to 2016, all of those projects that I did, I was the sole GP in those deals, not really the model of the co-GP model today. And you really do need to form co-GP partnerships because of how we're buying these deals now. But I was able to do that. And the advantage of that was I got to war, wear all of the hats early. Now I got to realize that some of those hats I was great at, and some of them were not necessarily my strongest suits. And some of those hats were things that I love doing. Some, you know, I was okay to do, and some was kind of tedious and I didn't really like doing. So now when I form partnerships, I look for complementary strength, strengths, skill sets um, of, of my partners, because something I find tedious might be somebody else's very favorite thing to do. 100%. Right. And something that I'm really strong at might be somebody else's weakness, or my weakness might be their strength. So in looking to form these aligned partnerships with people, you can kind of you know put it together so that everybody's really doing hopefully what they love, but certainly what they're they're strong at. Um, I know I kind of tangented off no, that question, that's, that's but good. yeah, yeah. I mean, we've we we were talking about this the other day, right? The whole uh, form like Voltron concept, right? Where where everyone's got their own skills and you form something better. Uh, the concept of one plus one equals three, and and 
you know, I think Brian's our systems and process guy, and Nick is our in-house cynic. And <laughs> people, people just love to throw spreadsheets. I didn't know that was me. a role. Oh, it's definitely. A I, I, look, I made it a role. Yeah. Like that's something you know. You you got to create something where they you don't think you're replaceable. Yeah. So that I just made something. So like you've heard in meetings that sometimes it's you're supposed to have like a devil's advocate. Nick's got the trident to prove yeah. that he is that yeah. person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, hey. hey, but you need somebody, and you need somebody in that seat, right? I mean, there's. Without a doubt, certain opportunities that we're looking at where Brian and I are very optimistic and Nick is very um, steadfast and his like, are we going to hit a grand slam or are we going to strike out, right? Or if we don't hit a grand slam, are we still going to end up with a single, double, or triple, right? And, and Nick is very, very good at kind of the cold water in the face and saying, let's say that we don't achieve X, Y, and Z is this deal still going to make sense for us? Sure. And and one of the things I love about our partnership is, yes, we have syndicated deals, but every single opportunity needs to pass our own investment criteria because our dollars are in those deals. And by the way, our dollars aren't coming from an ACC fee. Like they're coming from our bank account up front, right? We're laying out the earnest money. If that money goes hard, it's our money, so sure. on and so forth. And like I can't tell you how many deals Brian we've underwritten, and Brian's like, I'm doing better cash flow than that in my money market account with zero risk, and he's approaching it from our potential audience of of investors that could consider this deal, and I think it's very very refreshing, and it challenges us to find better opportunities and really kind of think about things in a different way. We're thinking about things from an investor perspective first, for our own book of business, for our own investment portfolios first. And then if we like it, we'd feel more comfortable bringing it to investors instead of just kind of the, the fee machine. You mentioned flips before. And one of the things that I think is very similar to the flipping business, to the syndication business in some senses, right, is flipping is very transactional, right? You buy a house, you fix it, you sell it, you buy another one, you fix it, you sell it, and you have maybe you have multiple projects. We approach multifamily investing as not a fee business, we approach multifamily investing as an investment portfolio growth business. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a key differentiator in today's market. You know, I heard a horror story recently of a syndicator that's got four capital calls going on and is raising money for two deals. Right. I don't know how that happens, Yeah. right? But like, that's not the business that we want to be in, right? We'd rather, if that's the case, like we'll buy deals for our own book, Yeah. get very, very wealthy, and, and keep, it, keep it in the family, if you will. Uh, but we want to be a very above board, fully transparent, like series of checks and balances type of you know, investment partner for our customers and, and, and for our investors. Sure, and they're partnerships, right? You're forming these aligned uh, GP partnerships, but also, and we talked about this at lunch the other day, and I think this is one of the reasons why we've connected. Our investors are our partners. That's right. And. I think the last few years with some of these deals struggling, there almost became this sentiment sometimes, and I, I, I think I circumvented in my deals with my relationship with my investors, but I've certainly seen it where investors are upset, so the investors are angry with the GPs, and there's that separation. And of course, I don't know how some of these deals were aligned in terms of their operating agreements, but the way that I've always set up my operating agreements on my deals is that I win when my investors win. Sure, there might be an acquisition fee because like you, you talked about the cash outlay and all the work that's done on the front end, and obviously there's an asset management fee for the asset manager in the deal. But as far as commission structures, the way I've always set up my deals is that I get paid when my investors get paid. Mm -hmm. So I win when they win. And we're, we're a team. We're not against each other. We're a team. Um, and that, you know, that kind of segues into, I think, you know, the last few years. And we talked about this, um, how, how I was able to grow from when I first met Nick in 2011 at Lifestyles, got my first multifamily syndication deal in 2012, uh, and then kind of how I worked through 2020. Obviously, we were in, in a rising market and appreciating market, and I like to think I did a good job, but just about everybody that came into the industry did a good job and was able to perform for investors. Um, the, where I think I've been a little bit different from a lot of people these last couple of years is I'd always been taught that bridge is something to be very wary of, bridge financing. 
And then in, in 2021, 20, 22, when bridge became really the only way that you could play in the game, right? You couldn't win a deal if you were looking at any other type of financing because you couldn't get the leverage needed to pay the price that was going to win the deal. So you were either going to com completely sit on the sidelines or you were going to do bridge. Well, I kind of took a, a cautious approach. I did a few deals over the last couple of years, but I made sure that there was a story there. You may be picking up a deal at a lower basis because of that story, not buying at the absolute top of the market where 15 factors had to go right for the deal yep. to be successful. And in my opinion, a lot of syndicators out there, especially some of the newer ones, maybe that are not apartment investing business people, but they are syndicators that have come in and learned the model, especially some of the newer ones, completely threw caution to the wind and they just started buying a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the deals I think that have struggled. Perhaps they're asking their investors for capital calls or perhaps worst case scenario, they are in danger of or actually being foreclosed upon. Yeah. All of my deals that I bought in the last couple of years, not going to say there haven't been operational challenges uh, resulting from things that are going on, of course, rising taxes, rising insurance, and all the other factors, but have not asked, asked investors for a capital call. I think that's very important, and I want to be able to continue to have that be part of my story. I've never had investors lose as much as one penny investing with me in the last 12 years. Everybody that's always invested with me has made money and some of them have made quite a bit. So looking into 2024, we're going to get through this with those deals on the other side and we're going to be able to, at the end of the day here, within the next year or two, I believe, make all of our investors whole and get them a return on top. So with that being said, a lot of people are very cautious right now because of those deals that were bought in 21, 22, and we talked again about re-educating people because the opportunity is here right, right now. now. Yeah. People, yeah. Are, oh, yeah. people are going to be squeezed because of the lending situation, these three-year bridge loans that they put in place back in 21 yeah. that are now going to be coming due, and these people are going to be forced to sell, and we're going to have opportunities to pick up some, some great deals. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that I'm on the front lines uh, the last couple of years, I kind of sat back. I was more of a consultant on a few deals, raised capital, was there, but I wasn't really the lead. But I see the opportunity here, and I'm getting back to how I bought deals from 2012 to 2020, which is being on the front lines again. I want to dive even deeper because we love to get a little bit more detailed on what our thoughts on the market are on this show and not be a lot, you know, too high, just bird's eye view. So I'd love to come back to that. I hope what some people, are, our listeners, are taking away and have taken away after the last few years is when you're aligning with a sponsor and partnering, I hope the thing that you're considering, Nick Good puts this really well, I want to know what the biggest challenges you faced are and what those outcomes were. I don't want to just hear about your wins. I, if you've got losses, I want to hear about those, but I also want to hear about how you're handling headwinds, how you're handling operational challenges. You can consider in the multifamily space the era of 2020, April of 2020, let's just say, through mid-2022, it was like it was like sponsors were um, running on that moving walkway at the airport yeah. and claiming they're the fastest man in the world. It was like, okay, well, yeah, you're, you're already on the thing that's moving, right? But that's not really a reflection of all markets, obviously. We, are, uh, we have a mutual sponsor in deals that we've invested in, and I know for a fact one of the deals that I'm invested in with him is facing some headwinds right now. It's just, it's organic, but they are not taking their, 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 um, you know, asset management fee or like they're, they have paired their operation to go, we're in this with you. And even though that deal is facing headwinds, I would write that check all over again with that sponsor and I'll invest in the future with them because of how they're handling the headwinds. I'm educated enough to know nobody could have seen the last two and two years coming. Right. I care about how you handled that time, and if you're gonna BS me with your you're batting a hundred and you're undefeated, so that you can raise more capital, I, I struggle to understand how people have four capital calls and are still raising money. It's like, does nobody ask questions yeah. around here? So um, I hope that's a takeaway for people, and I would really love to hear more about, you know, why specifically now on a more detailed level do you feel like we have such an opportunity going forward in 2024 and beyond with what's happened over the last few years? Uh, and what your goals are for your personal journey. Now that you're kind of back in the game, what does that look like? Well, I'll speak about my personal goals and then we can talk about where we are and sure. where, we, where we see things going, or at least in my opinion, where I see things going. 
you know, I never came into this for money, for the pure sake of money or for, for wealth or ego. For me, it was about being able to provide a life of financial comfort for my family where I just didn't really have to worry about money looking forward. And I, look, I'm not in the place where I, I don't have to do anything for the rest of my life. I'm still still working in the syndication business, although I'm in a pretty good place. Um, but for me, it's just all about financial comfort so that we don't have to worry about money for my family and also about creating experiences and memories with, with friends and family. And along the way, the way that I do that and the way I earn a living and get to do that is by helping a lot of other people. And that's my passive investors that place their faith, trust, and hard-earned money with me, you know, get a terrific return on their investment and uh, achieve some measure of financial comfort and security by investing within me. It's value for value, right? And if I don't provide that value, then, then I'm not compensated. It's about that partnership. Now, as to where we are in 2024, sure, there's going to be some operational challenges over the next year or two. Um, but where I see looking on things at kind of like a five to seven year projection, when I came into the business in 2011, everything was still coming out of 2008 and everything that that entailed and coming out and lenders had just started to lend again. I think the year before that, people were having to buy deals still with all cash. Mm -hmm. So lenders were just, you know, starting to lend again. Uh, you know, my first two deals were bank, bank deals. They were recourse loans. Mm -hmm. And now we're doing, you know, not non-recourse loans. Um, so it was just a different time. Um, th it's different because the reset has is, is, is been different and it's different circumstances. But I very much see the next five to seven years again, kind of how I look at things when I came into the business, that there's going to be an opportunity once we, uh, and we have to account certainly for the challenges that we might face throughout the rest of 24 and 25, and we certainly do that in the way we form our business plans and underwrite deals, and I know you guys do the same things, but I think after that, there's going to be an opportunity to ride another wave up, a yeah. wave of yeah. wealth building and wealth creation, and I think that if we buy intelligently, that uh, those of us that are out there in 2024 are going to look back and hit some grand slams um, with some of the projects that were Call those Mark Macklemore's. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Aaron, let me ask you a question, right? So it's 2024. I feel like you're the Michael Jordan coming back to the game, right? Uh, you started in 2011. You bought your first deal in 2012. You've had a very accomplished career, right? A number of, de you know, countless deals that you've done, a bunch of other deals that you've invested in. For those, if you're going to look at that time frame from, let's just say, 2012 to 2020, and there's an early in career listener on here or someone looking to get started, like what advice would you give that person to kind of compress your eight-year journey to less so that they can get ramped up faster? Well, certainly I would recommend that they find a way to invest in their education. Now, whether that means joining a program or just attending a lot of different events, but listen to smart people. Mm -hmm. Like I said, in any one area in this business, I'm never gonna be the smartest guy in the room, but I don't have to be, right? I listen to smart people. So figure out a way to invest in your education because that's certainly uh, a growth accelerator in the industry. And, 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 and look to partner with people as well. Mm. That's something that I, I didn't do out of the gate. But a lot of people weren't doing it at that time when we got started back in 2011. It was, it was more about the sole GP model. You just didn't form the co-GP partnerships no. and you didn't have to. Because, yep. because like I bought my first deal, it was a C-class deal in Arlington in uh, 2012 and bought it at $19,000 a door. <laughs> we probably just looked at that thing at 110 a oh, door. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's like nickel hot dogs back yeah. in the day. Man. Yeah, I raised $750,000 from 12 investors because I'd been meeting with people and I was able to do that deal. But things, things are different now. So... I think that because of these strategic partnerships, people have a way to grow faster than they did if they, you know, than I did from 2012 to 2016. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so pivot to deal sponsors because we're talking about up and coming investors and things like that and getting educated, which is a, such a common uh, theme, right? Investing in yourself, investing in your education. One of the things that I think is a big gap 
in our business is we tend to get smartest person in the room syndrome sometimes whenever we have a track when we have a, a, a run of success. Mm. I think that happened to a lot of sponsors over the last few years is that that build up from you know 2015 all the way pandemic aside those few months but all the way up that bull run where it's easier to hit home runs it really makes it hard to 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 continue to question yourself right and 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 when you're doing underwriting or you're taking on bridge debt for an asset that doesn't need it you just you you, you have, sometimes your cadence of education gets lost you become a victim of your own success right we talk a lot in our partnership about ownership. We're all leaders of businesses and sales teams, and if we don't show up every day, the business falls apart. We've experienced these things in our lives, and we, we have a lot of ownership in our partnership as well. One of the things that I love about all of us is while we, we can get at each other sometimes because we're all very driven, nobody passes the buck in our partnership. We take ownership of everything. What do you think is uh, what advice would you give to sponsors that maybe have taken a few lumps over the last few years about going back into possibly another bull run around the daily cadence or regular cadence of education of that responsibility that they have to their investors? If I'm a deal sponsor and I'm waking up every day, what should I be doing to be educating myself consistently to make sure that I stay at the top of my game? Like someone who's done double-digit successful sponsorships, what have you done to stay educated at the top of your game? Yeah, well, I, I don't think I ever really had to worry about the smartest person in the room syndrome because <laughs> maybe I'm just not that smart. That's okay. <laughs> and that's why you know all I've really focused on for the last 12 years has been apartment investing. And I don't knock people that do other things as well, but that's just not the way my mind works. Yeah. Like I said, maybe I'm not that smart. I'm just a focused person. I just have a laser focused and I'm able to achieve results if I just kind of set my mind to one thing. And that's what I do. You know, I think today there's more great education and there's, you know, through great podcasts like this or just listening to speakers, you know, I get emailed every day, uh, you know, three to four great things. And I'm not just talking about fellow sponsors, but economists and people yeah. that have minds that run at a far different level than mine, and, and I listen to them. And some of it goes over my head, but I soak up a lot too. And so it, it's, it's never really believing that. It's always also, I think, sticking to your you know, guns of why you got into the business, right? You know, having that daily dose of information in your inbox is like never been easier, you know? Right. Um, and I think we have a responsibility, right? The same way that we all have responsibilities to our families and our spouses, we have responsibilities to our businesses and our investors. And one of the things that it can be easy to do when we're having a run of success is just kind of ignore all that information because every swing of the bat is a base hit and we never really feel like it's going to end. But it's a really your responsibility as an investor, as I should say, as a syndicator, to make sure that you're staying up to date on the most relevant things yeah. that could affect your business. And we, we tend to lose sight of that. Yeah, I think you got to stay informed, but you also have to stay grounded. Hmm. And and how you not did things. Not give it to constant fear either. <laughs> yeah, not give it to constant fear, but also the way that you approach the business. It, it's not going to change based on outside circumstances, right? It comes from the inside. And so the way that you treat people, the way that you're going to approach deals, um, and, and for me, it's, it's greed has never been th the first thing. I think this is kind of, I'm circling back to yeah. what I forgot a second ago, was, um, you know, what's going to keep you from, from, from getting greedy? And I thought about that the other day, and I got to feel good about something. Yeah. I'm not, if, if something doesn't sit right with me at a gut level, yeah. at an instinctual level, then because I think it's going to be a lucrative opportunity, yeah. Maybe the partnership is not wrong, and I know that, hey, this is going to be a great deal, but this partnership's going to be a headache, yeah. and mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of partnerships, co-GP partnerships blow up, which ends up being bad for the deal and bad for the investors in the deal. So if I don't feel right about the deal, the underwriting, the market, the story, the vision, everybody that's on board with the GP team, then I'm not... I'm not going to jump on board uh, just because I think that that deal might may, make me and even maybe my investors a lot of money because I want to be able to sleep at night and uh, I, don't, I don't need those headaches. So, yeah. you know, that's what it is. So it's, it's making sure that I, take, I, take a, I, I slowly get to know people that I decide to partner and get into business with. And I've seen a lot of people in this industry that are real quick to, you know, get in bed with people quickly just to get a deal done. Yep. 
And, you know, it's about, sure, it's about acquiring more doors, like the name of this <laughs> podcast, but it's not just about blindly acquiring more doors, right? It's about the right deals with yeah. the right people so that you can, uh, you know, do right by your investors and, and do great projects. So And hopefully, yeah, for the communities, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. this is... You, sure. Because you, know, you talked... This As is a exactly, byproduct, always, yeah. yes. Because this is what you talked about, you know, we, we discussed this over coffee, right? Like... There's opportunity cost to everything as well. If you're just chasing dollars and cents, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And so if you're just focused on that, you will every moment that you you trade for a deal that you think could be lucrative but doesn't really sit well with you, there's another opportunity out there to really do something that does feel right with the right people and make the right uh, impact. I fundamentally believe that the ability to make money in this world is infinite, simply because we have machines that print it. So <laughs> it's really infinite to make money in this world. It's finite. Our ability to make a positive impact is finite. And so it's really difficult, especially when you're starting out, to pass on things, Be especially ones that you know can make you money. Because it feels like those opportunities won't come by again. It's not until you become a little bit more established to realize like opportunity is truly everywhere. The ability to make positive impact with that opportunity that's that's not unlimited because we only have so many years on this earth. And so I couldn't agree more with that mindset of like, you can be really defined by the, the opportunities that you pass on and that might be the best thing that you do sometimes. Yeah. You know? so Aaron, I have a question for you. Like on the, from an actionable perspective, right? I think we've talked about a number of times betting on the jockey, not the horse, right? Um, we've done our own kind of GP profile episodes. I think I'm in the hot seat next, yeah. right? I'm looking forward to that. When, if you classify Aaron as an investor, right? Your buy box, your underwriting, the target returns you're looking to deliver to your investors. What are the key metrics of a deal that you really look for, or or, met, uh, or neighborhoods, or where you want to invest? Can you clue our listeners in a little bit about, you know, what makes you know, what, what are the KPIs that Aaron looks at as an investor to kind of start to get excited about an opportunity? Yeah, well, most of just about everything I've done on the GP side, I've done 14 deals over the years, which is, I think, pretty accomplished. Yeah. But I've been in the business for 11, 12 years. And by some measures, that's slow and steady. But my full cycle deals, my average returns been over 100% over the years. I've never had an investor lose money. The few deals that I bought cautiously over the last few years, we're going to be able to ride out the other side, I anticipate, with no capital calls. So even though it's 14 deals and not 40 deals in the last 12 years, um, being able to build a good reputation with uh, industry insiders and brokers and vendors and investors alike. So I stand in a good place to take advantage of the opportunities that are here. In 2024, as far as what I'm looking for, it's probably along the lines, Matt, of what it's always been, the bread and butter, B and C class deals. Uh, you know, right now those deals are probably cash flowing in the neighborhood of five to 6%, total return over a five year projection around 90%. Um, I like to look at the submarket demographics, make sure that they're strong. I have uh, a, a two property portfolio that I'm raising money for right now. Uh, 506C out in the mid cities of Bedford and Euless. And, uh, you know, that's a real strong, it's a C class property, older vintage. I like to do newer vintage when I can, but when you're sitting in a sub market that has a median income of 61K plus, you know, that's a really strong C market. And then obviously, uh, looking at value add opportunities in these sub markets, wherever they may be, where you're able to come in and just kind of achieve something that's already been proved out in the neighboring submarket by other properties in the area, not wanting to be the first one on any block to come in and say, because that's speculative, right? right? And we're not speculators, we're investors. Mm -hmm. So never looking at things as, hey, we're going to come in and do this, but nobody's been able to do it before. Again, just neighboring properties have done this, they command these rents. If we come in and take over this property that's been being mismanaged and we're able to do what's being done in these competing properties, then we're gonna be able to achieve similar actionable results. And those are the types of opportunities that I tend to look for. Um, you know, don't buy in the hood, as yeah. another well-known real estate investor likes to say. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I had one property that was a struggle. I was able to get it through to the other side 
uh, that that was you know one of the lessons learned. It was it was my my least performing deal, mm -hmm. even though we were able to after three years get out the other side of it and still able to return a 25 percent return to my investors, which was far below projection, but it could have gone much worse. And I, along with everybody else, got sold the idea that this area was gentrifying. Mm. It was turning over and everybody bought, n think, was told that that was gonna happen and everybody came in and put money into the properties and then everybody kind of encountered the same struggles because yep. you were really just kind of turning over the same asset class. So the lesson learned to me was there was, I just kind of assumed that the submarket is by and large going to remain as it is. Yeah. And what I'm gonna do is just be able to come in and do what I'm already yeah. uh, seeing being achieved in, in that area and not reinvent the wheel or, or prove out something that hasn't already been being proven being out. Being proven, yeah. that's, that's yeah. one of the things I love about this business is, is we, we always talk in entrepreneurship about how success leaves clues. And I actually am starting to believe that Real estate is one of the few entrepreneurial pursuits where that is actually still very true, where tried and true methods still work because the, the, the velocity of innovation is making that less and less true in almost every other industry. If you're in the computer programming industry, if you're not reinventing your business every 18 months, you're out of business. Yeah. Right? Success actually doesn't leave clues anymore, uh, but it does here. And so the accessibility for entrepreneurs to get into multifamily investing is better than just about every other industry because there are so there's so much data and there's so much success that's already taken place that if you follow models there's still unlimited opportunity and I I do like what you say I think and I love that you wear your track record with pride of 14 deals you don't get into the boxing hall of fame because you had the most fights it's because you had the most wins or the that's best right. record right yeah. so I I take pride in the fact that you are a man that doesn't just do deals just to do deals because we all know sponsors that do that yeah you know. So how just uh, like on that on that comment, you probably could have at some point in time. You probably had the deal, the incoming deal flow, the investor book of business. You probably could have snapped your fingers, flipped the switch, and instead of doing one or two deals a year, gone to four or five. Why stay in your lane and why not stretch too far? Well, I just really like to focus again mm -hmm. on kind of one thing at a time. And when you're looking at a, a three to four month period, I tried at one time to raise capital for two different deals I contracted on at the same time. And I learned that that was something that I didn't want to do again. And I was able to trade that contract over to somebody else. And I ended up closing on uh, the property. And I made the right choice because that ended up being one of my most successful deals. We were yeah. able to return 225% return to investors Ooh. in a two and a half year period. 90% average annualized return. So that was a wow. good one. So I made the right call. But was it's just it a Bitcoin form or it's, something? It's being able to focus. <laughs> and look, to be honest, Matt, I mean, you look back at like 25 to, you know, 2015 to 2000. You know, nineteen. I, I, you know, I wished I'd bought everything in sight. Sure. Of course, in yeah. hindsight, right? But you had some values but, probably going through your head, right? Yeah. Some barometer and, where you're like, let me stay focused. And and to me, it's 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 not all about the grind. I'm never going to take on something to where, yeah, sure. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm doing three times as much, but I'm three times less happy. Yeah. For me, it's about the whole person. And if somebody follows me on social media, you know, one reason why I think I've been able to be successful in this business and respond to challenges is I spend a lot of time working on who I am as a whole person and certainly working on who I am as a real estate investor, but who am I as a human being mm. and my personal growth and the books I read. And a lot of them are outside of the domain of the area of business or real estate investing um, in the area of health and wellness, in the area of just personal growth. So I think that all of that all of that other all of those other things kind of inform me as a human being which means that when challenges arise and i have to work with partners or we have to overcome challenges you know we can't control the things that happen outside of us we can't control the things that happen in the world right these macro events that impact us as real estate investors but what we can control is how to be thoughtfully responsive yeah. And I think that you know experience helps, but I think who you are and how you've grown as a human being also can inform these things. So I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, on those areas as well, so that I can be the best human being and the best real estate investor I can to to thoughtfully respond to events and serve more people. Yeah, I love that. And we could we could spend so much time on that, and I want to be respectful of your time, but I I, I do want to dive slightly deeper there because that is a, a big founding 
you know, kind of value of our partnership as well is is the human beings that we are and the way that we choose to interact with the world. Um, you you strike me as a very thoughtful human and somebody who who spends a lot on his mindfulness. What are some of your sort of non-negotiable habits or cadences around the the work that you do on Aaron? Yeah, well, I exercise like five to six times a week. You mentioned mindfulness. I do meditation, um, a lot of reading. I'm a voracious reader. It was reading that led me into this business in the first place. And um, I attend a lot of personal growth and self-help conferences by myself or also with my wife um, to continue to grow and evolve as a person. And it, you know, f for me, it's about carving out time. It's not just about the grind. Um, and I believe that you can be successful in this business and not just be grinding all the time. And I see, you know, I see social media and I see different gurus talking about grinding. And look, that's not for me. That's not a life worth living. I can achieve what I want to achieve for myself. I can help a lot of people along the way. I can live comfortably. I can grow wealthy and I can do it all without grinding. And the last 12 years is living proof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can incorporate times where you know, I put the business aside and I focus on my family and I'm present with the people that I am and we're on a vacation somewhere. So those are non-negotiables. Um, when I partner with people, I tell them generally that uh, I love to travel. And when I travel, generally that time is sacred time for me to be with my wife, for me to be with the friends that I'm with or attending the events I am. So even if we're in a deal, you know, let's, let's figure it out unless we're at absolute crisis point so that you know, I'll do all the work I need to on the other side to set everything up. So, you know, those are some non-negotiables, carving out that time for myself, but uh, making sure that, you know, the deal is still front and center. And, uh, and, and I think that it comes from transparency. You mentioned it before, Brian. When I sit down to talk to potential investors, and even when I have conversations with investors, it's like, let's just be honest with each other. Let's not be afraid to say anything or step on each other's toes. And I think that that's missing in the industry because so many people are worried about saying what they think the other person wants to hear. And to me, that just means that if I just tell somebody what they want to hear, but it's not really the way I feel, then that's going to lead to conflict in the future. And I would rather just say what needs to be said right now if it disqualifies a potential partnership then that's meant to be or uh you know maybe maybe it helps to find a, a good alignment so transparency honesty communication in all regards and uh you know i'm going to be able to to sleep well at night living my life that way yeah. and to achieve what i want to achieve i love that <laughs> i mean that's i mean there's just so much goodness there. Yep. Yeah. So much goodness there. I hope everybody listening knows that, like, that's what your deal sponsor should be saying. If you're talking about the jockey and not the horse. Yeah. And, I mean, there's just the the amount of of self-awareness and self-restraint in some ways and self-appreciation. And, and I was just, I'm going to go, I want to go listen to that again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, if you're listening to this right now, go rewind the last 90 seconds or two minutes. We'll chop that. Good. That. And, we'll and, and here I am up. just thinking I'm babbling. You no. Know, just running dude, my mouth. So I'm glad like, that it's, I think know, you should I'm just drop the mic. Stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where, Aaron, you know, you're, you're going through a rebrand, right? So you're rebranding and everything else. Where can people find you? Um, you know, and what are the best places for people to connect with you on? Yeah, well, I'd love people to visit my brand new website at AaronKatzApartmentInvesting.com. I've got a lot of terrific stuff on there, featured properties over the years. Uh, whenever I have a current investment property that I'm that I'm raising for, if I'm able to put it up and 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 publicly advertise, which my current opportunity I am, I'm always going to have a page for the current investment opportunity. I've got some blogs on the top seven reasons why multifamily investing is a solid investment. I want to go and add soon a page that I'm going to about why now is a great time yeah. to invest in multifamily because there's a lot there. We've touched on some of it, but there's more and people will be able to see that soon uh, as soon as I add it onto the website and just a lot of great general information about me and about apartment investing in general and they also have an opportunity there to join my investor community and I'll follow up with them and begin to establish that 
uh, sponsor passive investor relationship where I'll be able to offer them opportunities to invest in either a current or certainly future investment opportunities with me at Aaron Katz Apartment Investing.com. If anybody wants to reach me directly via email, they can reach me at Aaron at Aaron Katz Apartment Investing.com. Uh, you know, one of my goals, and I appreciate, guys, the opportunity to come and, oh, and sit please, with you today because this is, is your stage that you've built. It's I'm happy to be here on your 30th anniversary Me and Jesse episode. These guys just show yeah. up. Okay. True, <laughs> no, true so story. I, I, gra- I greatly appreciate the yeah. opportunity to sit here in your beautiful studio and uh, record an interview and just have a great conversation with you guys. And, um, you know, that's that's really my goal is I've, I've been able to help hundreds of people over the last... 12 years, I want to help hundreds or thousands of others. There's a lot of people out there that don't know where to invest their money for solid, secure, or often lucrative returns. They don't know who they can trust. It's confusing for them. A lot of the conventional investment vehicles that are fee-based that, you know, people might be pushing to, um, you know, so I like to think I'm providing a solution. And I'm not going to say I'm perfect either, but you know, I think I'm bringing integrity, integrity, transparency, and honesty. And like you said, you know, success leaves clues. Uh, one, one of the things I'm proud of, Nick, on that investor website that I put up is a page of passive investor testimonials. Oh, and I have a lot on there. And these are actual unedited testimonials that people provided to me that I've worked with over the years, some investors for more than 10 years. And I don't think there's anything that I could say about myself that's going to speak more than what other people that have trusted their hard-earned money with me have to say about me. Yeah. So that's a one of the page. That's probably the page I'm most proud of on that brand new website. And that will be in the show notes. And and if you're you're you know watching this on YouTube, go ahead and make sure you hit that subscribe button. But that will be there in the description. You just click on that there. You can connect with Aaron um, as well as if you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or whatever, just leave a review as well. So we want to make sure that. Uh, you know, this this episode really gets out because this last we're we're an hour seven in that last 15 minutes was Fantastic. absolutely gold. Absolute yeah. gold. Yeah. All right. So as we wrap, if you got to see one rock band, let's say at Red Rocks or something, you only got to choose one. Who's your go to? All right. I, I got to give a shout out to some friends of mine. Okay. Uh, Uh, Out of Gothenburg, Sweden, a band that uh, a lot of people here in the U.S. don't know. They're pretty big in Sweden and throughout Europe, but they've been around since the late 90s. And they're called Hardcore Superstar. Okay. And they're actually friends of mine, and they're incredible guys. And you can go on Spotify and find uh, like 12 albums from them going back to the 90s. And uh, man, if more people could learn about yeah. these guys, I think they're they're my favorite hard rock metal band of the 21st century, and I'm a big hard rock guy. Right. So go check them out on Spotify, Hardcore Superstar. All right, so if any of Hardcore Superstar's albums go platinum now, we, we need to get royalties That's here. That's it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can just rewrite the intro song. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Instead of well, me beatboxing. It's funny, the intro song, just, just again, at the end of this, you know, we go back to your Mattress Giant days. That had the most catchiest oh jingle gosh. out there. Ooh, when, ah. When Ooh, you said ah, that, yes. it played in my head when yes. we first talked about that. I wanted literally. to sing it earlier when you were saying it. I'm like, because it was just, that's how catchy that jingle was. Yeah. I, I remember the origins of that jingle. Okay, we got to get this uh, story. Yeah, this is, this is uh, God, 1992. Uh, first time I was ever in Texas was in 1992. And uh, I was there with Abe and Carol Lang, who were two of our original partners in Mattress Giant and we were at like a Denny's or something and it was like one o'clock and we were talking about some of the different jingles and Abe told me about the the ooh ah and uh you know we yeah. decided that that was it and that was uh so you had a bunch of choices and that yeah was that was w- yeah <laughs> wow yeah <laughs> at wow. Denny's I love it Love we'll, it. We'll we'll send it to you, Matt, because you probably don't know that that jingle. No, I I, I was not here during that time. Oh, yeah. it was huge. Yeah, it's, yes. it's it's massive. I'll send it to you. It's very. Catchy. I don't know why, but every time uh, Aaron has referred to the uh, the mattress time, I back in New York there was this guy completely unrelated to mattresses, but it was Crazy Eddie, and he was like it was like the early stage. Best Buy. Yeah. He had like six stores across New York, yeah. and he would just come on. He's this is crazy, Eddie. Yeah, selling TVs on sale. And every time I hear the mattress thing, I remind. Yeah. I'm getting, That's for the some good reason, old days. I remember yeah. Crazy Eddie. Do you remember Crazy Eddie? Well, I 
When my dad first launched mattress discounters, he had a partner in the business. And the very first commercial they ever did for the business, I think he took his inspiration from that crazy Eddie guy, <laughs> and he was chopping up prices. It was like the most low budge commercial yeah. that every you could imagine. In the nineties was like deranged. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this, you know, this company, mattress discounters, ended up being the biggest bedding retailer in the United States over the number of years. Yeah. But they started with the most low budge, uh, you know, <laughs> chopping up cardboard prices that, yeah. that you could imagine but everything you know everything starts somewhere yeah right? it starts yeah. somewhere so yeah, love it awesome. yeah aaron thank you so much um please make sure go leave us a review go subscribe to the youtube youtube channel go to aaron's website it's i was just on it's awesome and it's Thanks. and it's only growing from there right so um you know we, you would you know just go support aaron out and we're thankful to have him come in and as well as look Go to Deep Blue Capital. So deepbluere.com. If you're if you're thinking about wanting to invest money, there's a lot of people right now that have, that are reaching out and saying, "Hey, what do I do?" Right? You know, it's it's great for taxes. You know, it's a great way to go place money securely with the right people. So deepbluere.com to sign up, um, as well as if you want a show like this, you got to hit up Jesse. Oh yeah. Right. Jesse makes everyone look good. Even if you don't think you look good, Jesse will take care of you. I'm a perfect example of exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> you and me both, buddy. You and me both. So just go to tourstudio.com, T-O-R-E studio.com, and uh, just tell them that the uh, More Doors podcast crew sent you over there. And um, I just want to say I'm like super thankful that Aaron came on yeah. the show and celebrating number 30 with us. It's yeah. I, I want to say thank you to you guys, too. Like I, I, I put a little Facebook post out there this morning about hitting our, our episode 500 download thing, and this has just been an incredible journey so far, and I know we're just scratching the surface. So, Aaron, thanks for sharing this day with us. That yeah. was awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. just it, been man. able to meet you guys and look yeah. forward to growing the relationship. Thanks for the invite today. Next yeah. time we'll go to happy hour instead of lunch, and we can have a margarita. There you go. Yeah. All right. Fair All enough. Right. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you next week.